What is it like to be a black grandmother raising a grandchild or grandchildren? Sociologist Dr. LaShonda Pittman felt these women were marginalized and had no voice. Mm -hmm. So she gave them an opportunity to voice their hardships, accomplishments, and needs. It's all in her new book, Grandmothering While Black. Welcome, Dr. Pittman. Thank you for your time and for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm such a fan of your show, and I'm really excited to be able to talk to you at last about something that's near and dear not just in my heart, but I think that is a pressing social issue that needs a lot more airtime. Hmm. Now, why, what is this happening? Is this, is it happening more than it ever did in the past? Is it happening less so? And what are the social trends that are changing grandparenting in America? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say that both and, right? So there are more grandparents raising grandchildren than at any other time in American history. So I think the number of grandparents just in general, not just African-American grandparents, but grandparents overall. Um, but also I would say for African-American grandparents raising grandchildren, it's sort of waxed and waned. And right now they're at a lower point than they were when I did this research back in the 2000s. Um, what is also really different is that something you just spoke to, which are the trends differ, right? So like how they're providing this care looks very differently today than it did in prior generations, which is something I really tried to shine a light on. Not only that there are more people doing it, but how they're doing it is so fundamentally different than before. Tell me about that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that there's this tendency, particularly with women of color, black grandmothers, like this is just something they've always done. My grandmother did it, or I know grandmothers that did it. Mm -hmm. And I argue that there are three things that make contemporary grandmothers experiences significantly different than their historic counterparts, which is uh, grandchildren's circumstances have changed. So you're dealing now with drug epidemics, um, both the crack cocaine epidemic of the 80s and 90s, and now the opioid epidemic. Um, you're dealing with mass incarceration of parents, which um, is something that's a more contemporary phenomenon. Um, you're dealing with huge income and wealth inequalities that are contributing to parents being under and unemployed and all those kinds of things. So their circumstances are different. That's a big difference. I think secondly, the need to legalize this relationship is different, right? Both with respect to the child welfare system now relying on grandparents more and more to uh, provide kinship care to children who need or they feel they needs to be take that need to be taken out of the home but also the child welfare system and also there's more of a need to have legal authority when you're dealing with things like child ring institutions to get a kid enrolled in school at times you need to legalize the relationship or to get a child medical care you need consent and so i think the need to legalize the relationship is really different and then lastly because now there are so many more black and brown children, African-American and American indigenous uh, um, Pacific uh, Alaska Native children that are in the child welfare system. Um, there is this very real and perceived threat of their grandchildren ending up in the child welfare system. And so if I don't mm -hmm. step in as a grandparent, then the next possible place for my grandchild is in a stranger's home. And so I think those are all was there ever a situation where you thought that your grandchild would end up in the system? All factors that really change the nature of grandparent caregiving today than in the past. Has anything changed about grandfathers being more or less involved than in the past? You know, I would, I would say probably yes. Um, you know, there's, uh, not not nearly as much enough research done on grandfathers as there are on grand grandmothers. The majority of these caregivers, 63%, I think, are women. Um, and so I think when grandfathers are in the home, then they are likely to be involved. At least that was what I found in my own research. Um, and, and there's some evidence for it in other research. There's still the sort of gender divisions of labor, though, right, that it's often women who assume the bulk of child rearing responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't change just because you're older. Um, but what is really unique about black grandmothers experiences is that unlike any other grandparent, they're more likely to be raising their grandchildren without a parent living in the home and without a partner. So they're they're doing this. 
Now, I do know that my grandmother and great-grandmother was a big part of my upbringing. But that's not saying that my mother was not there taking care of me because she was. Let me know, was there any difference within your upbringing? More than others alone. To be clear, the vast majority of grandparents raising grandchildren are um, two parent or two grandparent households. So there are grandfathers and grandmothers or or same sex couples that are doing this together. But for black grandmothers, they have that unique distinction of, of doing this work um, alone more than others. Uh, let me go back a step because what something you said surprised me. If you're a grandma and your granddaughter is on a bicycle, gets hit by a car and breaks her leg, falling on concrete, <clears throat> you can't take her to the hospital and check her in? You don't have the legal right to do that? You actually don't. I think that um, what happens now is like there's been, and this is something I didn't get to unpack as much as I wanted to in my book because space constraints, but the um, the need for legal consent has changed a lot over time with more and more medical care providers being concerned about being um, sued, wanting to make sure that, that the child that they're treating is... Um, the person who is bringing that child in is actually has authority to make decisions on behalf of that child, because if they don't, then the medical care provider could be found responsible. And so often what will happen is that grandmothers, particularly the ones in my study, what they did in lieu of legal guardianship was if they were on the child's medical card, because if the kid was receiving welfare benefits and they had a medical card and the grandmother was the representative payee, they would use that in lieu of legal guardianship. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And I think that's a really big part of it is that you may or may not be able to do this. And when a kid needs medical care, you can't go on a may or may not, right? Like, So why are we making it harder for a grandparent, mainly a grandmother, to take care of their grandchild? Who wants to see their grandkid in need of care and support and they can't themselves provide it? And so I think mm -hmm. that's a really big, big thing. Is that something states are working on or is there any legislative activity or regulatory activity to, to give this to grandparents? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question. So um, I'll say California led the way in terms of providing what we call medical and legal consents to um, kinship caregivers. And so it very much depends on the state that a grandparent is raising or, or relative, right? So we know that grandmothers are the first line of defense, aunts come second. So let me know about the laws in your state in regards to grandparents raising their grandkids. Um, so it depends on where they are in terms of whether they are able to utilize a, a medical consent. And the same is true with respect to educational consents, which aren't nearly as popular as medical consents because there's so much controversy around um, wanting to make sure that children are not being enrolled in schools in districts where they don't live. And so these medical and legal consents exist depending on which state you live in. I don't have the number off the top of my head. It's in my book, um, the number of states that have these consents. Um, but if you're in a state that they don't have them or if the grandparent doesn't know that they exist, uh, then it's as good as not having one. And so there, there is some legislation around that. Uh, it would be wonderful if it were universal and that it honored how families actually operate, um, but it does not. When perfect strangers take in foster children, they get subsidies. And I once met a family where that was the dad's full-time job. He had five or six grandchildren to help with the, the increased costs, of course, utilities, food, housing, etc. Do grandmothers get these? You know, I love that question. You know, it's a very sort of, um, to me, the perfect sort of question to talk about American values, right? I think that one of the things that we hold dear is that it's the family's responsibility. When at the end of the day, I'm a sociologist, so I know that it's not the family that creates these dynamics entirely themselves, right? Like we have to honor systemic and structural issues that lead to more and more grandparents needing to raise their grandchildren. And so this idea that it should just all fall to families and it's their responsibility to do, I think is ridiculous. Children cost money. 
Um, and more and more, um, you know, we are in a whole different time period in terms of just like the cost of raising a child. And so that, and, and this is interesting. Some of the grandmothers talk about this. They're obviously going to raise their grandchildren and the bulk of them do with very little government support. Um, for the grandchild itself. Like a lot of them are relying on their own social security, retirement, pensions, and so on in order to provide this care. And the majority provide care outside of the child welfare system where all they have access to are the social safety net programs that poor families have access to, which is basically a small cash stipend if they, they're getting a TAN of child only grant. And when I was doing this research in Illinois, it was $107 a month. And they're having a hard time getting $107 a month, right? And so so it sounds to me like they would much rather pay a complete stranger thousands and thousands of dollars a month to take in someone else's kid over paying a family member, which is atrocious. That, that is so, so evil. So children cost money, and I think that that's important. So these families often experience what we call the, the care of the love penalty. They actually love and care about the children in their care, and therefore they're not given support for those children. Um, and, and it causes the poverty that we see in these families. Grandparent-headed households, those that the parent does not live in the home, are more likely to be impoverished than most families in America. And when they're headed by women, like 67% or two-thirds of them live in poverty. Poverty. It shouldn't, it's not acceptable. We should be providing support for some of these families. If they're providing care inside of the child welfare system as a foster parent, um, if they are a subsidized guardian, if they've adopted, then they do get a stipend that's significantly larger than that $107 TANF child only mm -hmm. grant. And okay. so they, the vast majority don't, and they should. Can they get, can you adopt your own grandchild? You can. So the vast majority are providing care outside of the child welfare system. I think that one of the things that my book does, which I think is really important, it even complicates what that looks like because we have a tendency to romanticize that, that like, oh, the parent and the grandchild, then the parent and the grandparent got together and like had this moment of like, this is what should happen. And like, whatever. And sometimes that does happen, but oftentimes it's also fraught with conflict over who should be responsible for the kid and so on and so forth. You got, that's where the bulk of caregiving takes place. Then you get to the child welfare system where often if a kid is coming across the radar of the child welfare system, what often happens, not all the time, because we're now using, the state is using what's called kinship diversion, where the kid comes across the radar of the child welfare system. They don't take the kid into state custody and divert that kid to the grandparents' home with very little, if any, support. So that is a thing, and that's happening more and more, and it's not being tracked nearly enough. The second thing is that they actually take that kid into state custody. The grandparent becomes a foster parent. The parent gets a certain amount of time to get themselves together. If they don't, then the grandparent is given a couple of options. You can become a subsidized guardian in some states or you can adopt the grandchild. And so, yeah, you can adopt. Um, grandparents are less likely to adopt because one, they still most honor that parent-child relationship in matters. And two, something that doesn't get talked about nearly enough, which my book does, is that they actually want their grandchild to be in the care of their parent if their parent is able to care for them. Because guess what? They have their own needs and hopes and desires at mm -hmm. the stages in their lives where they're faced with raising a grandkid. They're 50, they're 60, they're 70, 80 in some cases. So, you know, they actually would love to kind of have some time to themselves, their partners, and to do other kinds of things that matter to them. We talked a little bit about trends having an impact and there are two more recent ones that come to mind. The first is the lack of stigma that used to exist when I was younger. Uh, children born out of wedlock were considered to be illegitimate children. Has mm -hmm. that, do you think, led to more kids ending up in their grandmother's care because uh, mm -hmm instead of going and getting an abortion or whatever else they might do or not having sex in the first place with someone they're not married to, um, boom, they do and it happens and there's a child. And then of course, along with that is the Dobbs decision of a year ago and making uh, abortion 
unattainable in 20 plus U.S. states. And now conservatives going after birth control uh, over the counter or doctor prescribed via telemedicine, um, getting rid of that <clears throat> mm -hmm. are either of both of or both of those having an impact on the number of children born to one parent with no other parent involved. Without a doubt, the increase in single mother headed households has increased not just in the United States and most certainly not just among African Americans, it is worldwide phenomenon. Um, in the United States, I'll say that African Americans are more likely to be, there's more single mother-headed households within the African American community um, for all kinds of reasons. And one of which we should be absolutely talking about first and foremost is the mass incarceration of African American men. Um, and so I think that that's something that has to be acknowledged. Um, I think also with respect to Grandparent headed households, one of the things that's really important to distinguish is grandparent headed households that are three generation households where there is a grandparent or grandparents of the parent generation and grandchildren. And then those that I study, which are skip generation households, they form for different reasons. Right. And so what we find is that there are many more multi generational households where there is a single mom often. Right. Who's living with her parents most often than not. Um, and they're helping her raise her children for a certain period of time, often when the kid is the youngest and child care is expensive. So when parents have to pay for, for both child care and rent, that's a lot. <laughs> In place, some places, child care is more expensive than rent, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think you see those kinds of households more prevalent. Uh, with respect to sink, skip generation households, it's not just single motherhood. It's things like, you know, what happens when that one parent that's involved is taken down, right? For various reasons, whether it's health problems, untreated mental health issues, um, incarceration, uh, mm -hmm. under or unemployment, inability to find housing, and so on and so forth. So I think all of those are real issues. I think any family is really vulnerable when it's just one parent. Um, so that if something happens to that one parent, guess where? The, guess what the next safety net is? It's it's grandma oftentimes. So mm -hmm. I think those are two mm -hmm. big issues that absolutely affects these households, but but sort of differently. Do you think we'll see a day where there will be more single grandparents? In I'm thinking skip generation households. You know, they still are the major, the minority of grandparent headed households. But I think as we're seeing, I mean, you've got different demographic things that are going to contribute to this, right? So mm -hmm. women outlive men, right? And then with African American women and women of color, increasingly they're less likely to be married, right? And so this is what I see with my own population, which is that. Whereas these women would have historically have been married and they would have been doing this with a partner, they're increasingly not doing it with a partner. And so some of the biggest increases that we're seeing in grandparent, pet, grandparent headed households right now are among white and Latinx families, right? And so they're still not on par with African American and American Indian Alaska Native families, but they're increasing. And so I think to the degree that those women are like not married, we're going to see maybe an increase in women who are doing it by themselves. But I mean, as fathers, for example, take greater roles in child care and house care, uh, and it's still creeping. It's not like a fire hose of an explosion of activity. But do you see grandfathers doing the same thing, especially when it comes to helping grandmothers or, you know, grandmother, the, the, a, a grandmother on one side of the child's family and the grandfather on the other, sort of both pitching in together, wouldn't it make it a lot easier on the grandmothers? It absolutely would. You know, what I found in my own study and, you know, and the, the results are mixed with respect to this. Many studies really note that these women don't feel like they get adequate support. Right. And I think that's very real. Um, what I found for the women in my study was that it wasn't that they didn't get any support. It was that the buck stopped with them. And there's a certain level of stress and responsibility that goes along with like, at the end of the day, this is on me, right? Like I'm the one who is getting up every day, dealing with this kid every single day and everything associated with, with raising another generation. 
I also found that for the women in my study that had partners, they may not have been married, all of them, but that had active boyfriends, long-term partners, um, they were involved. They helped. Um, I did have a minority of women who had conflict in relationships because they had decided that they were going to raise their grandchildren and their partners didn't want to. I had at least a couple of women whose partners left because they didn't want the responsibility. But I'll say the vast majority of these women did it be with partners who were involved and who helped mm -hmm. with their other adult children. So maybe not the parent of the kids that they were raising in some cases. So the question is, if you were put into this exact same situation and your partner did not want to they take on the responsibility, what would you do? Let me know in the comments. His parents helped, even if they weren't living in the home. I think that's important to acknowledge um, with their other children, with their siblings. And so I felt like one of the things that really differed what I, when I was looking at this compared to like young, poor moms who say they have less support is we're talking about older women, not old mm -hmm. necessarily, but older. They have a more seasoned network, right? They've got their moms, their sisters and brothers, their nieces and nephews, their own other children. And so they had a, a cadre of support that they could rely on that I think is really important to acknowledge. And they acknowledge it. And it's, it's, it's detailed in my book, everything from emotional and social support to um, economic support. They, they couldn't have done it by themselves often. Lastly, how does it vary by race um, or African? Why did you write this just about Black grandmas? Uh, are Latinas close behind in terms of numbers of them or a percentage of the population? Uh, white grandmothers? I love that question uh, for a number of reasons. One is that Black children are more likely than all other children to be raised in skip generation households. Mm -hmm. um, I think one in 10 Black kids will end up at some point in their lives uh, living in with their grandparent in this way um, compared to the next highest group was Latin X, which was 5%. So like 10% versus 5 so is literally double. So I think um, the experiences of African-Americans is really unique in that way. So you've got black kids who are more likely to end up in these households. You've got black grandmothers who are more likely to be doing this without a parent or a partner. And you've got black grandmothers and black children who are much more embedded in the child welfare system. Uh, the only other group that comes close are American Indian Alaska Native families. And so I think really giving voice to a community that's been incredibly hard hit by the criminal justice system, by the child welfare system, by these trends around grandparent caregiving is really critical. And frankly, I think they have a lot to teach all of these other racial ethnic groups that are starting to feel more of this now, what these groups are experiencing now, these grandmothers have been experiencing for some time. And so I thought it was really important to talk about um, what they have to offer um, the world in terms of their knowledge and to bring attention to this phenomenon where they need more support. They need a lot more support. We need to stop romanticizing this experience and provide these families with a lot more support. And since the country has, in the last few years, gone through a major revision of American history, particularly on enslavement. Um, and of course, the slave system, the slave owners system, uh, all the time broke up families, ripped mothers away from children at their breasts and, and married parents, etc. cetera. Um, do you think there's a vestige of that playing into this? One of the things that I teach African-American families here at the University of Washington, and I think one of the things that's really important to know is that a lot happened between slavery and today. There's no direct line between slavery. People like, you know, the we see slavery today. Like, you know, there was a point in American history where African-Americans had higher marriage rates than white people did. And so, you know, there are as soon one of the, the first civil rights that we took advantage of when slavery ended was to marry each other. You know, there's a wonderful um, um, historian, uh, Tara Hunter, who is at, I think she's at Princeton, who um, really captures this really rich history, right? And so I think it's really important to look at 
all the different things that happen across these different historic time periods that have contributed to this, right? At different time periods, it's been caused by different kinds of things. And so one of the things I really wanted to highlight with highlight with this book, my next book will deal with the historical, the historical um, sort of legacy of grandparent caregiving and what grandmothering looks like in all these other historical time periods. But for this book, uh, what's causing this today are some of the things that are impacting not just Black families. We're feeling it more than other families, but families today. And so I think it's really important to to sort of put slavery where it needs to be, but to look at all the things that um, Black people have done to hold on to and create family between slavery and today. And it's been pretty remarkable. Thank you so much, Dr. LaShonda Pittman, author of the new book, Grandmothering While Black. We really appreciate your time, appreciate your time and your elucidation of this amazing aspect of American life. Thank you so much. That's it for the Okay, so doing this interview, the sister say it. Uh, as time goes on, there will be more and more Black women uh, that are single as a grandmother. Let me know in the comments, why do you think that is? I, me personally, I think that Black love and Black marriages need to get back into the way it used to be and not let uh, outside influences dictate the marriage, the love, and the bond that we all share. Uh, let me know what you think about that as well. Let me know what you think about this video. Let's have um, a conversation.